Welcome to the Wolf Connection Podcast. I'm your host, John Kalfa. Let's talk about some wolves. Very excited to have a distinguished professor joining us today. He has been working on the Isle Royale Wolf Moose Project uh, there in the Great Lakes for now close to 30 years. Professor John Vucetich, he's coming from Hope, Michigan. He is a distinguished professor of wildlife ecology at Michigan Technological University. Sir, it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and it's it's wonderful uh, from my perspective to be here too. Yeah, I want to send a huge thank you to uh, Rebecca and Catherine, your your publicists, who uh, you have a new book coming out. I should have mentioned that in the beginning. So your book, uh, which I believe is coming out in October, is called Restoring the Balance, What Wolves Tell Us About Our Relationship with Nature. This is a perfect uh, place for you to be so we can have this discussion. So thank you for Rebecca and Catherine for reaching out to me and, and finding us here on the podcast to have this discussion. So I, I want to jump first, however, to part of the reason why Rebecca contacted me first. You are, you yourself and a bunch of other scientists have sent a letter to the Biden administration. Just please tell us about, because it's about ending the gray wolf protections. A lot of that has been in the news lately because of the, the situations happening in Idaho and Montana, a lot of which we have discussed on this podcast. You are the primary signatory on that letter. You're the first name there. I've noticed a couple of others that we've interviewed, Carter Niemeyer, uh, Adrian uh, Trevis. So just go through what that letter is about and what's the goal uh, of getting that letter to the Biden administration, what you're trying to get accomplished. Sure. Um, so wolves in the United States uh, can be managed under one of two regimes. Uh, they can either, under normal times, they'd be managed by the states. If they are, and states can make whatever kind of decisions they want. If, however, um, it's decided that wolves or any other species deserve the special protections of the Endangered Species Act, then the federal government takes over the, the management of the species until those protections are no longer needed. And so what we asked the Biden administration to do is to uh, reinstate protections um, for wolves across the lower 48. And, and at this point, the, the question would be why or what would the rationale be? And here's where things get complicated and there's some overlap, but, but uh, it is important to keep some of the issues separate. And here they are. The Endangered Species Act um, has a legal definition of an endangered species. And that legal definition, it's a little wonky, but here it is. It's a species that's at risk of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. And it's that last phrase, throughout all or a significant portion of its range, that's really very important. Um, that uh, phrase is not settled upon in terms of what it means, but clearly it has something to do with, you know, how widespread does the species need to be before it's all right? And the situation for wolves is this. Before humans started persecuting them, um, they used to live over most of the lower 48, really only a small portion of the southeast is a place that they never lived. Right. And now they live only, again, in the lower 48, they live on only about 15% of that former range. And so the concern that I've long had and have especially now is that to occupy 15% of your former range does not make you no longer endangered. That's still pretty darn endangered according to the legal definition. So that was the grounds for uh, now asking uh, for reinstatement. The other thing, of course, is, that's going on at the very same time is that several states, probably the two that stand out the most would be Idaho and Wisconsin. They've decided to uh, pursue extraordinarily aggressive um, hunting uh, regimes uh, against wolves. And, um, you know, that just kind of exacerbates the, the original concern, which is wolves probably don't live in enough places that they that they really ought to to satisfy the law. So anyway, so those are the, the, two, the two issues, what states are doing and, and what the law is all about. So we're talking about the distinction between maybe historical range and some more ambiguous definition of range. Is that, is that the issue? Yeah, the issue, yes, more or less. And, and the other way to think of it is this, is that um, you know species used to live in certain places before humans started persecuting them. 
and of those places and the places where they could still live. Because think about wolves for a minute. Nobody's asking or expecting wolves to live in downtown Chicago, even though right. 250 <laughs> years ago they did. They probably Nobody did. wants them to live in Phoenix, even though 250 years ago they did. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the unanswered question is over that historic range where they could still live. Where should they live and how many places should they live? And it really, if you think of it, it's such a remarkable question. So if I say a tiger, is it endangered or not? You'd say, well, yeah, of course, a tiger is endangered. And if I said a panda bear, is it endangered? You'd say, yes, of course. And I said, if I said a squirrel, is that endangered? You'd say, no way, a squirrel is not endangered. And how about a robin? No. So we think we know what an endangered species is until you look at a creature like wolves and you realize, oh my gosh, we don't know the boundary between endangered and not endangered. And, and uh, frustratingly, wolves are not the only issue for which this is the case. Um, there are other species uh, where, where the similar concern lies. It's curious because it's such a wonky, abstract question that comes from the law. But at the same time, it's a question that every American citizen has a stake in. And it's a question that if, if we express it in just the right way, every American kind of can easily wrap their mind around it because it's basically this. What is the deal with our relationship with endangered species? Do we want just to curate them and to have museum pieces here and there and that's all? Right. Or, and this is the hard part, we live in an increasingly crowded planet. There's humans everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and the challenge is to figure out how can we coexist with as many of these species as possible. And of course, I'm an advocate for trying to coexist with as many of these species as possible and not relegating them to uh, to just little corners of the country that we can't find any other use for. And thankfully, the Endangered Species Act is consistent with that idea. And so, yeah. Early on, I th we saw, or maybe I, I thought we saw Biden saying that he would support wolf relisting. Is there any hypothesis you can sort of speak to about why that changed or at what seemed like a really important moment in time for wolves or, or, or is that kind of just being um, guessed on right now? No, I think, well, first of all, I, I, to my knowledge, they haven't made a final decision. They're still deliberating over what it is that they want to do, but there is, there is concern. There's some writing on the wall that suggests that maybe the Biden administration will not act on behalf of wolves. And it begs the question why, or it maybe elicits a bit of disappointment. Of course, there's a lot of high expectations about some of Biden's more progressive uh, approaches to things, in, including what one might think about Endangered Species Act. And, you know, I think on this account, it's good to um, take a tiny step back and not look just at the Biden administration, but also to appreciate the Obama administration. The Obama administration was not especially good when it came to the Endangered Species Act or to wildlife. And if you don't mind, take a step further back and think about, uh, you know, even going all the way back to the Clinton administration. A lot has happened since the Clinton administration in terms of our relationship with nature. And we can see it right now in the news every, every day with you know, things like hurricanes and wildfires and crazy flooding in Tennessee. What's right. become clear, and I would have to say mainstream politics, is that we've got to do something about climate change. Now, it's a day late and a dollar short, that's for sure, but better late than never. You know, when we, and again, it's a relationship between humans and nature when we're talking about climate change. But, you know, the main beneficiary of doing good on climate change is us humans. And, and undoubtedly, that motivates us. And it's fine to do good things for humans. I think what we're seeing when we're perplexed at, uh, say, for example, the Biden administration not doing good by wolves is the way to understand it. And this is sad is that we want to be good to the environment when there's a payoff for us. And when it comes to there being a, a uh, you know, doing something good for nature, for the other creatures for which we share the planet, then I think we're a little bit slow to act, sadly, even for mainstream progressive kind of politicians. We're just not there yet, kind of sadly. And I think whenever we see these, what feels like betrayals, from some of our political leaders that you'd expect more from. I, I think that's what's happening. And uh, so it's uh, it's frustrating, but it also says something to those who um, are bothered by that, which is that we have work to do. We have work to do to explain to our mainstream politicians why it is that these kinds of decisions are important, um, e even though it may not be that the economy is at stake and, and that kind of thing. So you were saying just before, which I found uh, which was a great, uh, I didn't remember your words exactly, but how do you approach this subject and take the step back and come at this in a measured perspective? 
because it seems as though you you guys have crafted this letter really well and you're very well spoken. So what how what's the way that you reach across the aisle, so to speak, and, and find that yeah. that middle or that radical middle where we can meet people to make this change yeah. and make these big progressive changes? Yeah. You, you know, to um to move the needle, to make progress uh, in life, it takes all kinds of advocates. It takes all kinds of personalities. And so um, it, you kind of detected, and I'm glad you did, and I'm proud of it, that I, t- I tend to be measured in my words and uh, try to listen as much as I can. Uh, I th- That's just one of several strategies. It's very good that there are people who are a little bit more boisterous, a little bit more straightforward, if you will. We need those people too, d- just as, as much. You know, for me, um, where it comes from is that, the, you know, there certainly are people who are just plain old nuts. There are people who will never change their minds ever. I get that. But I, I think also there are people who um, who think differently than I do, think differently than we do. But they're not crazy. If you if you take a look at them, that they're they're good people. They have families and they have friends that love them, and their coworkers think they're good, and all this kind of thing. And so it just makes me realize, wow, if there's a person like that, and I'm a fellow citizen with them, you know, I mean, I owe it to engage them in some conversation. And uh, in my in my first interest is not for me to promulgate them with my ideas. It's to understand them. Like, why, why are you thinking this of this differently than I am? I mean, we're both, we're both smart people. We both see things going on around us. What is it that you see differently than me? And, and to do that is not like an acquiescence of my own views or values or anything. It's just a, it's just a, a part of it is just curious. Why do you think differently? And, and of course um, you can't do that all at once often, even with one person, you have to sometimes become friends with somebody that you disagree with. And uh, and we need that strategy too, because of course there's so many issues in our country for which there's obviously a lot of polarization. And uh, and, and we there just need to be some people amongst us that uh, just, for me, it's just motivated by curiosity. Why is it different? And I tell you what, one thing that's complicated about it is that you invite people who disagree with you to ask you questions about your own views. And then you realize, geez, there's a couple of them that I might have trouble answering to that would explain myself. And But if you do that with a friend, a friend who disagrees with you, you know, you have the patience and the time to work through it. And, uh, and you know what, sometimes you change your mind and sometimes you change their mind and sometimes you're left still without anyone changing their mind on a particular issue. But anyways, that's a little bit how I see it. Mm. Yeah, I, I feel this because I, I just had a, a solo podcast myself just a week or so ago. And I, and I found myself recently just being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I feel like there's a lot of that out there where people really go to one side or the other because they're comfortable. And it's, as you just stated beautifully, there are ways to to make these big changes. It's just you need to get outside of the rash, the thinking that you believe is rational. And we, Stephen and I, have had this conversation with so many individuals who re, are we're reaching across and talking to those people, those groups that may not think the same way, but in the end, the goals are the same. And I think that's a huge it's a huge reach for a lot of people. And I, I think it, it's tough to do that. So I think with yourself and the large, the large group that you have making that push, hopefully, do you think that encourages others to do the same? Oh, I hope so. Um, again, I, I believe that it takes lots of different kinds of people. There are people who are more like more fiery than I am. And I'm thankful they're there because they have a really important role to play too. And I wouldn't do it as well as the way they can do it. Uh, but, but as, as our conversation has been going clearly, we, we need these more measured conversations as well, not again as, as vehicles for acquiescence, but just vehicles for better understanding where we're all at. And um, do I have faith? You know, this is a, a challenging thing. I mean, there's a lot of bad things going on in the world and to think otherwise is just not in touch with the reality. And here's the thing. Um, I think two things motivate me. One is I'm not responsible for other people's actions or attitudes, that's on them. It's only my job to explain myself. That's kind of it. And the other thing that is responsible for me, this is this is the part for me that's especially hopeful. Me and everyone else at every moment has the chance to do the right thing. And that's where the hope lies. 
Now, how it all turns out, I have no idea. I have a feeling if we could fast forward 30 years from now, some parts are going to be worse than we imagined. Some parts are going to be better than we imagined. And some parts are going to be like, didn't see that coming at all. And so, I mean, I mean, the future will be this kind of a, of a mix, but I'm not a I'm not nearly as concerned about that as, the, as this most, what for me is the most hopeful thing is that every single one of us at any moment can choose to do the right thing. It's not always easy to have the willpower to do it. And it's not always easy to even have the judgment to know which is the right thing. Some, sometimes it's hard. Other times, of course, it's easy. Right. Yeah, I, I also think it's, you know, based on what both of you are saying, it's, it's almost less important that we agree and more important that we can communicate effectively. I think yeah. this this feeling of polarity that just seems to be perpetually looming over our conversations in 2021 as as citizens of the of the, the same world of the same same country is just as much about this lack of space that we're creating for communication as it yeah. is about the fact that we disagree, which again I I'm not sure is is as important and um I think we can. I think we can compromise. I, th- I think it's just the nature of our our of our delivery lately as a as a a total you know species is, has been has yeah. been flawed in that it's it's not leaving much space for for productive communication, which I, which I, I do think is 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 priority. Yeah, you know, and a good specific example of that would be what, one of the fault lines, especially with wolves, is like urban rural. So if there's a tendency, not a rule, a tendency for rural people to think less of wolves and be more inclined to want to kill them, and urban people to be the opposite. And and you know what I've learned, but I've learned it mostly through listening, is that you know if you live in different places, if you live in a city, if you live in a, in a rural area, um, I live in the middle, not quite urban or, or rural. Um, you know, you you have different challenges. If you live in an urban area, man, there, there's crime you got to think about. It's really expensive to do little things, even like park your car or buy a cup of coffee. And if you live in a rural place, you got different kinds of challenges. But and, and, but people sometimes rural people sometimes pin those challenges on wolves. And I'm like, wolves are not your greatest trouble. My goodness, you guys have really poor infrastructure when it comes to the internet. You don't have nearly the health care that you that you deserve. You don't get as much money for schools as you should as compared to urban places. Man, those are your problems. And, and you spend all this energy on wolves, you're not actually getting anywhere. You know, but let's let's talk about those other things that are really important. Again, health and education and, and internet connectivity. Man, I'll get I don't live in a in a really rural place, but but I, I'd get right behind you. I'd push just as hard as you are in favor of that. And so, but again. I think that's an example of the kind of communication that you're talking. But when two people come together and it's like, I hate wolves, I love wolves, I hate wolves, I love wolves. Well, man, you're not going to, the, the city person isn't going to get a chance to kind of learn about some of those challenges. And uh, and then quite frankly, the, the rural person isn't going to appreciate that. You know, you got it pretty good living in a rural area in different ways. You know, again, uh, you know, crime and, and the cost of living in, in many ways is is less and, and you get all of the health benefits of, of being in a rural area, pollution and all that sort of thing. So, but yeah, you, you said it so well about the communication. Yeah, it's just about understanding that I think it it's so easy to forget that there are people living completely different lives than you just a few hours away. Um, so I think that's an important uh that's an important thing to remember. But just uh, my last question on on the ESA, but I, I was reading that one of your, you know, significant contributions to this topic of wolves uh, has been interpreting of uh, interpreting the, the the ESA. Uh, I could be totally wrong, but I feel like interpreting is a fairly meaningful word, um, or maybe it isn't. But the document does the document require that much interpretation, like deep interpretation? Is it that complicated? Does it need to be amended to be more straightforward, or 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 why the word interpretation? Yeah. So, um, so there's so many levels to this, and we can touch on each one of them. There's a legal level, there's what might you call a philosophical level, and there's a political level. And I'll, again, I'll say something about each. From a legal perspective, it's common for our laws uh, to use vague words like significant. And in this case, it's that phrase, significant portion of range. And uh, so what is significant? Well, significant means different things in different contexts. And, and lawmakers are, are generally speaking wise to use words like that because that means that the law then becomes more applicable to more cases. 
you can try to narrow it down, but then you'll end up basically being too narrow. Now, of course, the trade-off is, is that you're, you're burdened with interpretation. Now, normally the interpretation of the law is usually already well established and it's established through prior court cases. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that's very peculiar about the Endangered Species Act. You know, it was created in the 1970s. And when it was created in the 1970s, there was a great effort to put a number of species on it right away because there was a need to do so. And when species got put on the endangered species list in the 1970s, it didn't really look as though like we have to worry too much about bringing them off because they're a long ways from needing to bring them off the endangered species list. And so what happened is that the law makes this definition that creates a boundary between endangered and non-endangered. And it turns out because the species we were focused on in the 70s were so far past the boundary, you didn't actually care precisely where the boundary was. But then as some species started doing better, wolves are the iconic case here. When some species start to do better, well, then some people say, well, you should probably get them off the list. And other people are like, no way. And then it ends up getting settled in the courts because if you wait too long, somebody's going to sue to have it pulled off. And if you try to do it too soon, somebody will sue to put it back on. And then that forces the judicial system to start interpreting that. And here's the thing is that that interpretation wasn't even remotely begun until about 10 years ago. And by that time, the Endangered Species Act was 25 years old. So it's unusual for a law to be around so long and for something so important not to have been interpreted. That's essentially what happened. And the courts, um, you, I'm sure you know, the courts, their basic MO is to basically kick it back to the federal agency whose job is to administer the law. And they basically just say, you didn't interpret it properly, go back and interpret it better. Sadly, the Fish and Wildlife Service, who's responsible for doing this interpreting, um, they have, you know, for the better part of a decade, more, a little bit more than a decade, they haven't really got it right. They have lost almost every court case that comes up on this issue. And so you were right to identify. I was uh, you know, one of the first people to identify this kind of uh, ch challenge in the law. And um, and um, yeah, so there we have it. It's you know been 12 years that people have been duking it out in the courts anyways. And, and we still haven't really haven't really got it yet. Man, that's amazing. Why do you think wolves in particular are the ire of so many and they are this polarizing species to just about anyone because as you said before when you when you talk about i think i asked this to someone else you know you don't get this with lions or bears or tigers uh, you don't get this with other big predators but it seems to be and maybe it's because and this just is my opinion maybe it's just because we have the opportunity and the chance to interact with wolves on a more regular basis than you do, say, a lion or a tiger, for instance. Bears, I think, are becoming a little bit more of an issue as well because they are coming back so feverishly and they, and they are getting into a lot of communities. But what is your, from, from someone who's studied wolves for, for three de over three decades now, what, why do you think they are the, the poster species for a lot of this discussion for the ESA and all these other issues that come down the line? Yeah, there's a there's an easy answer, and then there's a deeper answer that's much much tougher. And the easy answer, I think, reasonably sure even, is um, is that for better and for worse, um, we have turned wolves into symbols. And so when we talk about wolves, we're not talking about just wolves. And this is really to great disadvantage to wolves because they they don't know their symbols, they don't want to be symbols. But we've made them into that, and we've made them into symbols for all the things that we love about nature. And we've made them into symbols for all the things that we hate about nature and are afraid of about nature. And so when we have discussions and arguments about wolves, it's really about our relationship with nature on the whole. And so that's one of the reasons why it's also very important to get it right with wolves. And so, and then it, and it also kind of begs the question, well, well, why is that? Why have wolves become this symbol? And why not tigers or mountain lions who are like genuinely dangerous as opposed to wolves, which re really are not? dangerous to humans, that is. And um, and I and here I can only speculate. Uh, and my speculations run this way. They are that, um, you know, wolves, more so than other carnivores, more so than other species, have some stunning similarities to humans. The most important is that we both live in family groups. A pack is a family group. A pack is uh, two parents 
And then for the most part, offspring from prior years, there's some variation. So that sometimes there's an uncle or a cousin or something like that, but, uh, but they're family units. And of course, humans live in family units. This is the reason that dogs make such amazing pets because they know how to live in a family. And that's why cats are different, right? You don't, you just live next to a cat. You don't like live with cats. They're not part of the family. They just, they, they're living yeah, in your presence quite right. happily often. It, exactly. And so, um, so that's the first thing. There's this deep similarity. The other similarity that's so important is, it has to do with our diets. M- many of us, not all of us, but many of us eat meat. And the meat that we like to eat is the same kind of meat that wolves like to eat. It's large ungulates. So it's uh, deer, elk, moose, cows. Um, We like those all the same and and so do wolves. And so I think what happens is that when we look at wolves, now I'm speaking a little bit to human nature, you know, we don't know whether to admire them or to despise them um, because in some ways they're better at what we, it is that we all do. And, uh, and they compete with us a, a bit. And so I think we're kind of caught in this uh, world of maybe a little bit looking in the mirror. And, um, and so I, I think those are some of the deeper reasons that, uh, that wolves, uh, you know, embody all of this and, and kind of in, in, uh, instigate all of this excitement. Yeah, because I was reading, I, I got a, a chance to get a, an advanced uh, copy of your book. And so I, I only got through the first three, three chapters, but you really lay this out beautifully. And that was, I believe, in, in the forward and also in the first chapter about wolves is this real symbiotic relationship that we've had over the course of, I would imagine, tens of thousands of years of co-evolving with wolves and how, like you said it just before, is that mirroring effect. And Stephen and I have encountered that here at Wolf Connection many times and, and really just seeing how people that come to us in, on our property and look at our wolves and wolf dogs, they see the similarities in themselves just in the stories of how they came here of some of the neglect and the abuse and things of that sort. How, when, when you speak to that angle of it, are there... I'm sure there are individuals that sort of look like it's woo wooey to a to a degree, but how do you articulate that in a way that is more informational and able to sort of pierce that feeling of well, it's just magical, mystical? Because you try to debunk that a little bit. I, I not maybe not debunk, but sort of counterbalance that in your book. Yeah, you know, I think that um, boy, it's, it's a hard question you're asking, but I I um, I think the way that I I would start to answer it is um, with an idea. First of all, life is magical. Like our own lives are magical. So like that's, you know, we just this sense that there's like something wrong with thinking that life is magical. And so if like my life is magical and yours is too, then the notion that other forms of life is magical, like that's all fine. And so, but then, but then I think what comes to mind is this, um, this kind of fancy word called anthropomorphism, which if you just, I'm sure you know the words, but for the sake of perhaps some of our listeners, um, you know, anthropomorphism, what it literally means, if you break it down, it comes from the Greek, it means to make into a human. And it's usually kind of used in a derogatory sense, like when you inappropriately turn an animal into a human. But really, let's think of it. Um, humans and non-human animals, certainly we have differences, but certainly we have similarities. And so the trick is to not attribute to them things that they don't have, but not to deny them things that they certainly have. For some creatures, this is hard to do. For some creatures, this is easier to do. For every creature, there's going to be a blurry boundary line where it's hard to know. Does a creature have that capacity or that experience? I don't know. And so when it comes to wolves, there's a number of things that are pretty straightforward that that make them kind of an easy creature to think about. Well, what do they have in similar to us and what don't they have similar to us? And then again, you mentioned a little bit why, because dogs basically same thing as wolves in terms of an evolutionary sense. So their capacities are very, very similar. And we, we live with dogs. So we know very well what dogs are capable of, what they're not capable of. We know they're capable of a wide range of emotions. Shame, that's a pretty complicated emotion, but dogs totally know shame. Um, pride, they're totally capable of pride. We know that dogs can remember things. We Like what happened the day before, they remember who they like and who they don't like. So they, they have you know, this ability to, 
to know these sorts of things. Well, th these are the same ingredients that make our own lives rich. You know, when you, uh, to think of your dog again, if you get out your suitcase as though you're gonna go on a trip, your dog knows you're about to leave, even though it's maybe been several months since you've done that. And of course, you know that too, if one of your loved ones is gonna go on a trip and you're not so excited about it, but you see them packing and the same emotions are arising. Man, as a speaking straight away as a scientist, understanding how the central nervous system of a mammal works, man, that stuff is not that different between a dog, a wolf, and a human. And, um, and so, you know where it gets complicated and actually these complexities, this is the most amazing thing. How about a moose? Man, moose are, moose are, they're really different. The main difference is they don't live quite such the social life. Now, if you live a social life, it pays to understand what shame is and pride is because you can use shame and pride to basically get along with the people around you. And, um, but moose don't do that. And because most don't do that, they probably don't have as complicated a range of emotions. They certainly have fear and they certainly have joy. Now, let's think about joy for a minute. I, again, their physiology, a moose's physiology, is that of a mammal. And mammals are not that different when it comes to joy. The, the hormones and the chemistry that occur are about the same across the mammals, in, including us. So the only question is, what makes joy for a moose? And at this point, my goodness, this is just fascinating to think about. I suppose it would be that first bite of greens in the springtime, right? I mean, we all dig a green salad, right? But man, they desperately need one after all winter of eating nothing but twigs. And, um, and then what exacerbates a moose or it makes a, a moose feel ex, uh, exasperated? Um, I suppose it would be, and again, this is where you mix a little bit about what we know about the biology, the hardcore physiology of a moose, and what we know about what their feelings can be. We're not even talking about emotions anymore. We're just talking about basic feelings now. One of the things we know about moose is they get hot very easily. When it's warmer than like about 55 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit, they have to start doing things to, to kind of cool off. They get in the water if they can, they sit in the shade if they can, they don't eat as much, which is for them is kind of a bit of a problem in the summertime. They really should be eating as much as they can to get ready for winter. And so we know these things about moose and, and, you, and again, but they can't always be in the water. And so, you know, they wish they could be in the water sometimes when they can't. And you must be like, you know, and now I'm only, in, I, that, those are facts. I know that stuff that can be demonstrated plain as day, but now the rest are imaginations. In June, I suppose that's tolerable because it's just one or two days that have been that, cold, that hot, but man, by August, oh, it must be just just dreary as can be like uh, how we might not like a long, long winter. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable, but not certain that something like that might happen for a moose. And again, what you do is you start blending the parts that are certain with the parts that are like, well, that might be true and it might not be true. And here, what you have to ask is what's at stake if I make a mistake in these attributions, I'm, pretty sure the basic mistake that could be made is that I would care too much. And man, I don't think we're in danger of caring too much about others. And, um, and so it's, it's while you want to get it right as much as you can, because you can make imaginations that can lead to harm inadvertently. Um, you know, for the most part, it leads to people caring more. Yeah. This is so fascinating to me. It's, it's that fine line of ob observing and projecting, um, it's something I think about often and even, um, you know, I have a horse, a dog, two cats. I'm around a lot of other critters all the time. And even when you're sure you've got it right, you still end up going back to square one and reassessing whether you're noticing something or projecting something. And uh, I, I find myself constantly asking myself, am I noticing something or projecting something um, on this horse or this dog? But in the context of, of being a researcher, do you find yourself asking whether you're projecting or coming across a, 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 a tangible finding, how do you do further assessment? How do you weed that out of your, of your research or, or does it, does it really, does it matter really? Yeah. So, uh, you know, let me give, um, a concrete example and then explain how, because of the particular research, I do have a kind of, kind of easy, um, a particular example would be with domestic cats. Um, you know, when, when a dog is in pain, 
we're probably pretty good at kind of figuring that out. We kind of understand what behaviors they exhibit um, to let us know that they're in pain, and then we can respond accordingly. Uh, cats, these goofy cats, because they're so different than us, um, you know, when they're in pain, they don't really exhibit the signs in a way that we've always been so reliable in figuring out, and, and it's it's led to suffering in the past inadvertent suffering and no one meant it to be but in terms of like veterinary care and stuff like that we hadn't realized cats had often been in pain and just didn't realize it and uh, so, so that's a good example of how you could misjudge because we expect a certain sign from an animal when it's in pain and it doesn't always do that you know think about rodents and stuff like that so we um you know we all have occasion to come across a mouse maybe one that's in the house or something like that and you know maybe you know a rodent's response to to, to fear is basically to you know, get its eyes covered and uh, we would project, pretend like it's not there. But the point is, is by the time a little rodent is in that state, man, you, we don't, we don't so easily recognize it as fear, but man, that thing is terrified. If you know what its heart rate was at that moment, it'd be through the feeling. And so, so I think these are just examples of where there are cases where you can project and it's, it's, it's not good. The antidote to that is just enough science because I used science to explain why it was different than that. Um, now for, for my own, if, 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 uh, for people who study animal behavior and people who study veterinary science, man, they've got to do that all the time, very well, excellently. I don't quite do that much of that kind of research. So I um, don't have to do too much of it. My research and my professional activities are mostly at the population level. And, um, how and why it is the populations fluctuate in abundance. And then my conservation work is, uh, is, is mostly in the, in the notion of just giving animals, sharing more with them. And, uh, and I don't have to write the line too close on what they're feeling in order to, in order to make those cases well. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Cause I see that initially and I, and I'm, Again, I'm not trying to spoil. Again, I've only read the first three chapters, everyone. So, but you you draw that line so beautifully because you share some of your your journal entries and you you write so well about going back and forth. Like we've all the three of us have been discussing about this philosophical, this magical, and this scientific way that you're going about studying this particular place in Isle Royale for for this length of time that you've been there, I'll, 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 I'm going to just going to shift because this question came up and I, I don't want to lose it because if we get close to the conversation, what was that initially like for you to, to basically carry on the back? I, I, I know about Dave Meach and you're this, th- you're, I believe the third gener- I want generation, but the third generation of scientists now that has taken on this project what was that initial, what was that initially like for you to, to dive into this particular set of moose wolf? And it's such a close confined space to be able to study. What was the, what were the emotions that went through that for you in particular? Right. You know, um, so, so to answer the question, I should say a little bit about my history, how it is that I came to be involved with the project. And so I, um, I started working on the project as a, as a student when I was 18 years old. And this is the reason that I can say I've been doing it for, now I'll be strictly honest, it's been 32 years since I started doing the work. And, uh, but I started young when I was 18. And, um, and my, you know, my supervisor, my mentor, uh, was, was, the, was the previous leader of, of the research project. His name is Rolf Peterson. And, you know, I, when I was 18, I had no idea that I'd still be doing it 30 years later. I was just an undergraduate, just learning things and figuring out what direction my career might go. And uh, things unfolded just, you know, one day at a time, one month at a time. And, and what happened um, over a long period of time is that Rolf decided it was a, a right thing for him to retire. And so when he retired, there was an opening created at the university. I competed for it and, and got the uh, professorship that I have now. And, um, and then that's the way that I kind of officially became the leader of the, of the project. You know, the, the, the day-to-day stuff was a really slow transition. Rolf is still deeply engaged in the research. And so, and we have an, an, another uh, younger scientist, her name is Sarah Hoy. She's been with us for five years now and all three of us contribute almost co-equally at this point. And, um, but I do want to focus on, on the, on the, the, I don't know, the, the scope of it all, the bigness of it all. You are absolutely right. There was a time when, while Rolf was still there, 
but I was in charge. If it went bad, it had been my fault. <laughs> and and this really was, you know, uh, known throughout the world to be an, an amazing study. And, and Rolf, and then before him, Dave Meach and, and Derwood Allen, they were an advisor, student pair. And, um, you know, they had done such an amazing job and they had, they had, um, uh, pioneered methods for studying wolves. They had discovered things that nobody had ever discovered before about wolves. And, uh, and here I was, just some kid who had grown up in a suburb north of Detroit, um, you know, finding myself really intimidated and, and not fu maybe fully prepared to do what had to come next. And um, that being said, um, you referred to it as being generational in a sense, and it certainly is. Um, you know, every generation has something that it can offer. And, and in some ways, it's a product of one's generation. And so our conversation here today is a kind of conversation uh, that would be very difficult to imagine in 1965, right? To talk the way that we are about animals and wildlife. Um, this is before the Endangered Species Act is even created. And so, um, I, um, it will be for other people to decide whether I've done a good job or not. Uh, but what I, what I have done my very best is to be human about it. And what I mean by that is sometimes when people think about scientists and what scientists sometimes do themselves is they say, I'm a scientist and therefore I'm going to sever some part of my humanity away from me because I'm a scientist. I mean, that's not the right thing to do. I'm a human first. And I'm a scientist second, and the science can be hitched up with all these other important parts of one's life. And, uh, and that's the thing that I have done my best, and I've been doing it for a while now. And, you know, when I started, it was scary because my colleagues were, you know, mostly of like just the straight science kind of stuff. And so it did, for me, anyways, it took a little bit of bravery and, and skill to be able to do it well and defend it well as, as, a, as a way to approach things. And uh, for me now, it feels natural. I, and I'm not the only person who's been doing this. Uh, you know, uh, the other people uh, uh, around the science community have kind of realized this is the right way to go at about the same time that I've been doing it over the last 10, 20 years. And but you, but you certainly get a sense that um, the, the the generation of scientists that will that that I'm teaching now and college just started again this fall. Um, you know, they're going to find these ideas second nature. And they're not going to have any trouble with kind of the merging of facts and values in a wise sort of way. I hope anyways, they're certainly more familiar with it because they see it more frequently. And so, I mean, I, I hope that somebody remembers me for something like that. Cause that's, that's what I've tried to do. I feel like the time, the length of time on this project is, is still really significant and 32 years on, on the same project is just pure commitment. What, what happens over 30 years on the same project that doesn't happen over a fraction of that of that time. How is year thirty on the same project different than year five? The, the, the most important thing is you hang around long enough to realize how your earlier ideas were wrong, and that's super important. So most studies in ecology last for a couple of years, and and in a couple of years, it's common to get what would seem to be a clear idea. And the, and the clearer the idea, the better. And of course, the clearer the idea, the harder it is to like let go of. And and what's happened is, and I, I can give one example. Um, you know, for a very long time, it was presumed that Isle Royal, uh, the wolf population now, was completely isolated in terms of there were no wolves coming and going from the mainland. And it was presumed that because of that isolation, they'd be inbred but they didn't seem to show any bad signs of being inbred. And so for decades, that was a very firmly held belief. And it really wasn't until about, just very roughly now, about 2000 and I guess seven or eight or nine, somewhere in there, um, that we realized that two of those ideas, two of those three ideas were very wrong. One is there had been a fair amount of gene flow in the past, back and forth between Isle Royal and the mainland. The wolf population indeed was inbred. We believe that and have since confirmed that. And then the other thing is that um, they actually had been suffering from inbreeding and we just never recognized it. And so when, when, when researchers, and there's great pressure to study things for a short period of time and move on to something else, a lot of kind of quirky things about the profession that lead to that. But when that happens, 
um, it's, it's hard to discover your mistakes. And man, discovering your mistakes, that's what the growth of knowledge is. If there's no discovery of mistakes, there's no growth of knowledge. And so, um, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the great values of studying for a long time. I have the, a similar question about Yellowstone usually, which is because of the unique situation, is there, you know, in the case of Yellowstone, it's the sheer number of people observing these animals. There's millions of people every year. Um, in this case being isolation, is there any research that you feel is limited because of the uniqueness of the scenario? Oh, um, not in a meaningful way. And what I mean by that is everybody has some kind of limitation because there's something about the system where you can't do this, that, or the other thing. So like everyone's on a level playing field that way. You know, our, our great challenge is that it's so hard to get to. I mean, it, it takes a whole day to get there, sometimes a day and a half, depending on circumstances. And once you're there, you're kind of stuck because uh, it's hard to leave. Uh, so just uh, the logistics and the equipment issues that surround all of that is, I mean, that, that's one of the, the main obstacles for sure. And so, um, but, but the other thing that I would say is that um, there's a, that, that demands a certain simplicity. And there's a certain simplicity about all this that I've really deeply treasured about it all. You know, some, and without speaking about Yellowstone, we, there's a lot of great comparisons that can be made between Isle Royale and Yellowstone. We can do that in just a moment, but I want to just compare Isle Royale like with other research more generally, wildlife research. Some research is really intensive. It, it's ex extraordinarily expensive. Um, it involves handling a lot of animals. Animals don't generally want to be handled. And, um, and so I've been proud of the fact that um, in the big picture and over the decades, we're pretty small impact kind of a project. It's not very expensive as research goes. And I'm proud of that because there's a lot of good things that need to be done with money these days. And we and, and the return on our investment is pretty high. We get a lot of good knowledge for how relatively little this costs. And, and that also is, is true with respect to the impact on the animals. For, for, for most of the decades that we've done this, it's involved radio collaring just a couple of animals every other year. And that's been all we needed to get all of this information. And so another, again, a really big return on investment for kind of a small impact. So I've been um, you know, really proud and excited about that. The other thing that's important here is that, you know, because I, as you pointed out, I've been doing this for a long time and here I'll be slightly facetious, but to make a, a point every year, I only get two new data points. One is for how many wolves there are. One is for how many moose there are. How much can you do with that? <laughs> And, and so it, what it does is it is it forces one to, and I don't want to say be creative, that's too, too cheap a way to describe it. What it, my, my background, my real expertise is population biology. It's mathy and it's understanding why the numbers go up and down. Um, but because we've been there for so long and we can see it, and because so many people are aware of it, what will happen by way of example is we'll meet somebody who maybe knows something about ecotoxicology. We have a conversation with them and they realize, oh gosh, you know, those teeth that we are in all those skulls that you've collected of all those moose, you know, there's probably mercury trapped in there. And that mercury is a record of mercury deposition on the landscape. And you have these teeth that go back decades. Oh my gosh. Well, that's something that if I was there for a few years doing this work, I wouldn't be there long enough to, um, first of all, meet somebody who would uh, recognize that kind of connection and then to be able to understand, oh yeah, we really can kind of answer it. And so it forces one to, uh, in a sense, kind of diversify. And so we have, so we've done stuff that's on various aspects of behavior, ecotoxicology, isotope ecology, straight population biology, um, you know, all, all these various dimensions of environmental science. And so that, that in a way is an asset uh, because the, the, the other modus operandi would be when I've exhausted all my expertise at this place, I'll move on to the next place. And uh, I, I haven't picked that life. And so, um, so I have this alternative way of going about things. Is there any connection when, I'm sure there is, but what, what's the connection when you are ingrained in the, in, the, in the project itself and then when you go to teaching at Michigan Tech, is there is it really, do they, do they intertwine sort of seamlessly in that you're sharing this knowledge with, with your students and are they in turn able to help with that study? How does that go back and forth with, with those two projects? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the teaching and the research, they, they're they they're tightly bound. And so in, in a couple of ways, um, really truthfully, one of the richest things that I do in the year, and I, I share this quite a bit with my other colleagues, Sarah Hoy, is um, every spring we have an internship. We have between four and six um, undergraduate students that come spend a month with us on the island. And, uh, you know, there we are, we're living together in a, in a you know, field camp kind of situation. And, um, and the, the, you know, for many of them, that's the first time they kind of maybe get to know a professor in such a personal sort of way. And of course they realize they're human, just like everyone else. And, um, and that's an important part of it all. And, um, and so you, you just get to, um, well, first of all, share so much with them and watch them grow right before your eyes in a month's time. And, and this has also been such an important experience for people. They have been doing this for a long time. They report to us now 10, 20 years later, they're in the workforce. Uh, they say this was, you know, life-changing experience to have spent that time on the Island. And then, uh, and then in the classroom, um, you know, I teach two classes. Uh, one is a population biology class. And the other is is a is an environmental ethics class, and um, yeah, I mean, my personal experiences are a big part of all of it. Um, th- I love theory; I love it to no end, and so I teach it in part because it's important. Uh, students don't always connect with theory so well, and so you have to uh, you have to take a little effort to help make those connections. And theory even though it has a bad rap, it doesn't exist in isolation. Theory is only there because we think that's, we think that's how the world might work a little bit at least. And so, um, and so, so you know, I'm able to share with them how it is that I've seen it in my own life. That something that is unfolded before my eyes uh, can play out in this other really kind of abstract uh, sort of mathematical theory about ecology and populations and so forth. So um, yeah, no, it's, it's been, it's been a, a fun opportunity to be able to be in the classroom and have had to had all these experiences to share. It's incredible. So I know we're on a little bit of a time crunch. So I have, I'm going to ask you my last question that I asked to everybody that comes on. And then I, I do want to promote the book. So I want to get an idea out there of uh, what people can expect when it's released. So my question to you, uh, Professor, Dr. Busetich, is when you hear the word wolf, what is the thing that comes to your mind? Um, you know, they're our brethren. They're, they're, they're not a resource to manage sustainably. They're our siblings. We, sh- we share the planet with them and we got we to gotta do better at just sharing. And um, so, and, and, and sibling doesn't, isn't kumbaya kind of thing. If you have a sibling, you know that getting along with your sibling is not always straightforward. It's complicated to know what the right way to do that is. And, and wolves certainly qualify as that. But they're not a resource. They're they're our brethren, and that's that's the that's what comes to mind. I love that. So, just tell everybody what they can expect. So, the book is coming out again. I believe in uh, early October. Restoring the balance: What wolves tell us about our relationship with nature. What is what do you want people to take? What if they were just to look at the title? What is something that they can expect when they flip through those pages and they read your your offering to them? Yeah, you know, the, the book has 10 chapters in it. Each chapter is written in a somewhat different style. Some of it is, is memoir. It's about my time on Isle Royal. There are journal entries of things that I saw and what I learned from it, sometimes personal things, sometimes scientific things. There's um, a, a chapter or two that's about the history of the project itself because it's the longest study of any predator prey system in the world. It's been going on for more than six decades. So there's a lot of history. And and it's not history just for its own sake, but it's a history of way of kind of showing how our knowledge of wolves has changed over time. In in a lot of cases, because of things we learned on Isle Royale and how it affected our understanding of wolves everywhere. And um, and the other thing that's a really important part of the book is that it's the story of the wolves themselves. Much of the book is, is their story. I've had the great pleasure of being able to follow their lives from day to day, individual wolves that I know in a sense personally because I've seen them day after day, but then also from season to season, year to year, and from generation to generation, you know, I know their grandparents and, and great grandparents in some cases. And um, and so what one gets out of the reading their stories is you realize wolves have lives and, um, and, and, and they're, their lives are important and we should care about them. Uh, Other parts of the book have to do with the fact that um, in recent years, Isle Royal wolves started to not do very good. They were almost on the verge of extinction. And the National Park Service 
had to make a decision about whether to restore wolf predation or not. And it was a difficult decision for them to make. They made what I think is the right decision, which is to restore wolf predation, hence the title of the book, Restoring the Balance. Even though I believe they made the right choice, I think that some of the reasons for why it's the right choice, I think some of those are a little less resolved. Even, even some of the things that I've said in the past, I, I now second guess whether is that really the right reason to have done this? Still th believe it's the right thing. And, and the reason to explore this in such care in the book, was it the right thing to do? Is not because I.O. Royal is so important, but because of what I.O. Royal represents. What I.O. Royal represents, first of all, it's one of many national parks where climate change is taking things away from the national parks. And we have to figure out if we're gonna fight to save them or if we have to sometimes maybe sadly, tragically say, I think we gotta let that go. I mean, think about some things that were just straightforward like glaciers and Glacier National Park. There's nothing you could do to stop the loss of the glaciers. But other things are more challenging like sequoia trees. My goodness, I don't know how you save sequoia trees from the droughts that are liable to happen in the future but I have a belief that it's possible. It might be Herculean in effort. Should we try it? I don't know. And anyways, we're gonna have more choices like that. And, and the other thing slightly more generally and slightly more broadly is, is that you know we live on this increasingly crowded planet where humans are taking more and more and more. And, um, and we have to figure out how to get along with the non-human world, how to at the same time satisfy human needs. And, uh, and, and, the, the, and rather amazingly, Isle Royal offers some, some keys about understanding that as well. And so the book runs all of that. Uh, again, the 30 years that I've spent there, all the way up to the to basically the environmental philosophy and the environmental ethics of, of why restore wolves when we have the chance mm -hmm. to do so. Well, we'd love to have you back after the book's been out for a little bit. Um, we didn't want to give too much away or talk too much about it today. But once it's out a little bit and, and folks get a chance to read it, it 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 sounds just like an incredible read and we'd love to have you back to to maybe focus on i don't know one of the chapters or or, or one of the concepts and just dive a little deeper into one of those if you're open to it uh, that would be amazing i would i would yeah. love to do that oh this has been great is there any before we let you go is there any place where people can find because i know you've written a bunch of papers uh and had studies out there is there any place where they can check out your information so that they can is there a way for them to keep up with isle royale or some way to see your work and, and what's going on. Sure. We have a webpage. It's called isleroyalwolf.org. isleroyalwolf.org. It's spelled in the way you would imagine. If you type Isle Royal Wolves into the into a search engine, you find it pretty quickly. And then my my university webpage is pretty easy to find too. Just my name and Michigan and Wolves. My name and Wolves probably come up pretty quickly. And then my university webpage has some uh has in particular some of the things that I've done on, on environmental ethics awesome. as well. Uh, Professor Dr. John Vucetich, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for everything that you are doing. Uh, congrats on hitting 30 plus years at Oyo Royale. And just please continue to do the work. Uh, more people like you are needed uh, on this planet. So thank you so much for joining Stephen and myself. And like Stephen said, we're going to have you back on once the book has been out for a little bit and we can, we can chat more about it. My goodness, you're very welcome. And it really has been the same pleasure for me as well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. How's to everybody out there? And Steve and I will be with you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Looking to support Wolf Connection or sponsor one of the wolves in our pack? Just go to wolfconnection.org, click on the Donate tab, and find out more information. <laughs>